Right. It's a Sunday here at Phono Stage Audio. Having a bit of tea and cake that I've brought to work with me. And, um, <laughs> well, it's lovely and quiet here. It's the best time to do a video. There isn't too much traffic outside or anything like that. And I want to just do, uh, this is the, uh, the first part of the full review of the Graham Audio LS59F. As you can see, we've got a couple of pairs of Graham Audio speakers here. Uh, we're big fans. Um, the reason I say it's the first part is because I'm also going to do a, a write-up review of these speakers. It's very difficult to uh, sit down in front of the camera and remember everything that I want to say that's been popping into my head as the, as the week's gone on. Um, and I've got quite a lot to say because uh, it's took me a little while to review these. These have not been an easy thing to... Um, to get me head round or to review. But now I believe I fully understand uh, what they've got to offer and who they've got to offer it to, and I'm gonna tell you all about it. So um, if you like this video or any of our videos or just us generally, which I hope you flipping do, um, just like and subscribe and share. And uh, if you subscribe, you'll be notified of other uh, videos coming up that we do, got loads planned. Um, yeah, so welcome, it's nice to have you along. Right, so here we go. Let's, where do we go with this? Let's start. I've got no cue sheet or anything. That's another good thing about doing the written up review as well. I can't multitask, okay? I don't know if it's just me. If I try reading something, my mind just completely empties and I can't remember what I was saying in the first place. So this is straight off the top of my head. So the LS59F, got them out of the box. You've seen the unboxing video. It was brilliant. Yeah, of course it was. And... Um, Straight away, people started asking me, you know, uh, when are you going to review these? You know, what do they sound like? What do they sound like next to the LS6Fs? And lots of other questions. And I've been saying, yeah, I'm going to review them. I'm going to review them. I'm going to review them. I thought, I'll listen to them a couple of times. I'll do a bit of a review. And it hasn't been that straightforward. Um, right, firstly, okay, the reason it hasn't been straightforward. Okay, the big speaker, the big and the heavy. You need a little one of those mini fold-up sack trucks at least to move them around. You can't just pick them up off the floor. The big, the heavy, they've got a big bass driver and the human mind, being what it is, makes little synaptic links and has little misconceptions and preconceptions and all those kind of things going on. And it's, um, you were kind of pre-programmed after a lot of listening and after a lot of sitting in front of big speakers compared to small speakers you know this is naturally going to happen where your mind is going to tell you it's going to expect a certain amount of bass i mean understandably it's big that's big this is big you're not going to get that much bass out of it you know um and you think is this right you know is this right we're not getting was you know should be having more bass and this and that. yes it's right uh, and what we really learned, what really understood from this is that certainly if you, if you listen to a pair of the original LS59s, you know, even though they were sort of a biggish cabinet for, a, you know, what was essentially a small monitor speaker, uh, and they did have quite a big driver, is they've never had much bass. They were designed really as a, as a, uh, for, as a step up from the LS35A. You know, when you sort of go into a room that was just a bit bigger, maybe a control room or something, and the LS35A just wasn't going to cut it. You know, that was really being used in, I suppose, more mobile kind of environments or very tiny little places. Um, and great as these speakers are, and I am a big fan, I listen to LS35As a lot here and at home. Um, you know, they have the limitations that... They're fantastic at some things, not so good at other things. Like if you're going to start playing heavy rock on an LS35A or something with thundering bass or Billie Eilish or something, you're going to you're going to be missing something, you know, and that's either going to irk you or you're not going to bother because you're getting so much of something else. Well, the the, the simplest way that I can tell you what these sound like is, and this isn't you know, a pair of big LS35As. LS35As or LS5, LS59s without the roll off. So, whereas they're not so much greater in bass, they are greater in extension, if that makes any sense. You can hear all the lower notes, 
You can hear the things that you probably wouldn't have heard on the LS59s, but um, you don't hear them loud. You don't hear them in a way that your brain is expecting to hear them from a cabinet and a driver of that size, okay? And it is a case of nothing added, nothing taken away. Um, when I first got them out of the box and had a listen, I put on my default testy tracks, the things I know so well, I know exactly what they sound like. There was some Stephen Wilson in there, and there was a granddaddy in there, and there was some rock, I think I put a bit of, even put a bit of Black Sabbath on just because I've been listening to that, I listened to that quite a lot with the customer recently, there's one track where you can just hear just how it was recorded and produced on the right gear, it's quite a, it's a bit of a, you really feel like you're in the room with them, you know, and it's a, a great experience. So I listen to a lot of the things that I've been listening to lately that I think I can use as a bit of a reference point, a little point of datum, and um, trying to, you know, my, my first initial reaction was a bit like underwhelmed, right? Now this is, this is going to go somewhere, right? This is not an underwhelming speaker. I'm going to make that very clear. This is not an underwhelming speaker. It's an extraordinary speaker. We have to get to that. But my first initial thing, comparing, coming into it cold, big speakers in my mind, um, listening to music that perhaps didn't, and didn't suit the speaker straight off, I was thinking something was missing. You have to recalibrate your brain if your brain has been calibrated a different kind of way. If it hasn't, and you've been listening to LS59s at home and you want a bit more, or you've been listening to LS35As and you decide you want a similar, clear, transparent, give it all away kind of a sound in a bigger room, these are going to be right up your street. If you listen to this kind of thing, or this kind of thing, or even this kind of thing, then these speakers might not be up your street. Whereas if you listen to maybe this kind of thing, or this kind of thing, or even this kind of thing, they're going to be absolutely fantastic. And um, I'll give an example of that, okay? So uh, we have tried these speakers. I say we because I haven't just exclusively listened to these. It's been a bit of a team effort, okay? There's been a couple of people that uh, kind of helped me get set up in here, uh, very experienced listeners, Um They've both spent considerable time with me, with these speakers, bringing their own music. Um, we've tried them with various amps. Uh, most latterly, which you'll see in the photo that I've, um, that I've uploaded onto the uh, Phono Stage blog page, uh, we've used them with an Exposure Pre and, um, and an Arcam FMJ multi-channel amp. The reason we use the FMJ is because after trying uh, these with the Aston True, we've tried them with the Quad Artera, we've tried them with the Exposure 2510. These are some fine amps. Uh, they're all in the sort of between 70 to 90 watt sort of a range. Um, I did want to try them with a little bit more juice through them, a little bit more current because I did read uh, that they can benefit from having a little bit more watts behind them, uh, even though you know they're not rated you know particularly highly for that. But um, so we brought the FMJ in, which is uh, something like 150 watts a side into eight ohms, very easily delivered. This thing will it's just it's just a, a power plant for anything that you throw at it. Really, it'll put 250 watts aside. I think stable as anything into four ohms over seven channels. Each individual channel is completely separate from the other. So when you just use two channels of it, you've got an AB, AB class, clean, just chunk of power source really. It's known not to known to be particularly good for music as well as, as AV stuff. And um, has no particular sonic signature unlike some of the other later Arcams. So it's a good amp to try it with. But we went through an exposure pre, exposure DAC, um, streamed a lot of stuff yesterday. So we tried it with more current, we tried it with less current, we've tried it with vinyl, we've tried it with CDs, uh, we've tried it with all kinds. So we've had a really good listen, um, maybe about 
five or six of us over a period of time. And uh, the general uh, thoughts are, uh, one person said to me, one lady said to me, she said, it's like it's a musician's speaker. And she listens to a lot of acoustic music and a lot of stuff like Gypsy Kings and things like that, but also a lot of brass band stuff, classical. She has a family of professional musicians uh, and uh, who play uh, brass at a very high level and have done in the past. And um, she was sort of like in her head thinking that is the kind of music that these are going to be excel at. And we were listening to Miles Davis yesterday and that was just fantastic. It was just fantastic. The bass, it wasn't, you know, the upright bass wasn't particularly low and thundering. You couldn't feel it. But you can't when you, when you listen to an upright bass. That's kind of a bit of an audio illusion, you know. Um, you can when you put it through a PA, but if you listen to an upright bass or somebody's in, you're in a, a, I don't know, a small club and somebody's playing an upright bass, you can't feel that bass, but you can hear every note. And this is the kind of thing that is going on here. And the trumpet is raspy and it's brassy. And, you know, the saxophone is gorgeous and you can hear all the readiness and the breathiness of it all. Uh, Andy Williams, right? Never listened to Andy Williams critically in my life, but a customer came to listen to these, brought Andy Williams with him. Some of the Andy Williams stuff kind of didn't really ring my bell. Um, uh, some of it, though, the production, the noises, these kind of like quite into the sound effects on some of these. You know, it's quite interesting. There's kind of a jazzy shuffly drum going over in the left hand side. Nice flammy little sounds. And then there'd be sort of a clang on what sounded like some kind of percussive instrument. And you could hear it decaying off through a plate reverb. Clear as day in the right hand side. It was like an un it was an unveiling of production. Once upon a time, I nicknamed the uh, LS35As uh, music deconstruction machines. And I think this happened when I was sat with them at very close quarters in a monitoring setup, um, doing um, and listening to some ABBA. And my wife said, put some ABBA on. And I could suddenly hear all the stuff in ABBA that I'd never heard before. Layers and layers of vocals, the way that it was all put together. You sort of got a bit of a... I was touched by the genius of it all really the way that it was and it, you know but you could it was I'd never been able to hear it that clearly before I was literally I was this far away I think from each of the LS3 5As sat down they were like that on the desk pointing towards me and and that's where I got that's where I coined that term these are like big music deconstruction machines so um a friend of mine I don't, I don't know much about classical and after I'd done these kind of like, after I thought I'll, I'll form my own conclusions and then I will start reading reviews of these. And the reviews are read, fantastic reviews. Um, but most of the people that were talking about these were talking about, I tried this with the 1964 pressing of such a body conducting such a thing uh, or whatever. It was a classical album. I would never know what that is. And I don't listen to classical music. So um, a friend of mine did come here and he did listen to some classical music. And he said, ah, now I know what they're good at. So in keeping with those other reviews, yeah, if you like classical music, definitely. These excel at that type of thing. And you can just imagine the sort of development of the 5-9 originally, where it was the idea you know, I have a Derek Hughes on an interview talk about this, where you could um, walk from the control from the from the from the auditorium into the control room with these type of speakers, uh, and you would still be able to hear a very similar sound moving from one room to the other. It wouldn't radically change, leaving you having to approximate what kind of sound you were going to broadcast. So, classical music, jazz music. Anything like, say with the Andy Williams, where it's kind of quite broken down in the production, clearly produced. You know, um, a lot of effort gone into each individual sound, uh, quite well spaced out in the stereo field. That sort of thing where you can pick stuff out, comes out, it's fantastic. Female vocals, amazing. Even Billie Eilish, now come on, Billie Eilish, right? Lots of bass, 
Phineas, you know, he likes to chuck the, the sub bass in there and all that kind of stuff. You don't get that. You can hear where the bass is, like with the upright bass. You can hear every note. You don't get that, you know, that ground shaking. You're not going to feel it. But um, I, uh, I got into... I'll give an example. So um, if you buy the latest version of uh, Logic X, the, uh, the Digital Audio Workshop, the music production package from Apple, one of the things that comes with it is a... Um, a, a a breakdown it's all the tracks it's basically a, it's, it's basically um it's billy eilish and it's ocean eyes and they've included it as part of the logic package partly as a learning curve a learning experience really is like a bit of a lesson a bit of a model a bit of a model citizen of how you can produce music so well on logic x because you know like billy eilish or not this is a grammy award-winning album for production and everything you know it's fantastic and it just shows just how many layers of vocals and just how many times the vocals were recorded to get it right. And there are layers upon layers upon layers upon layers of uh, well-recorded vocals on these Billie Eilish tracks. Very complex how it's all put together. And uh, the result is, is phenomenal. It sounds very affected and it sounds kind of like very, um, sounds perfectly tuned. There's no auto-tune on any of it. And uh, it's not really very affected. It's just recorded and then layered together until they've got the sound that they want. And um, when you listen to something like that on these, and a friend of mine and I sat down and we listened to that a few tracks quite a few times, their ability to start unpicking those vocals and those effects and the percussion noises and the reverbs on them, and all the other different things, much in a way, I was listening to it, and I was picturing the track breakdown on Logic. You know, it's like, uh, they are studio-like, uh, and certainly if you are a musician, um, then the person who came here, and she listened to these, and said they were a musician's speaker, she's absolutely right, they are a musician's speaker. They're a music, uh, they're a music deconstruction machine for things where the production de deserves to be deconstructed because they're also ruthless about badly produced music. It just seems to go nowhere with these. If it's not produced very well, they can't do their job of deconstructing it, putting it out at you, you know, in its bare form. They can't do that very well. And also when music gets particularly busy, you know, um, I'd say out with the cold play, you know, uh, that, which is great for me, you know, um, out with the cold play, because it comes in nice. You know, there's one track in particular, and I can't remember the name of it. I have a, a mental blockage about cold play, which I've been trying to keep. And um, it comes in nice. There's kind of piano and it's acoustic guitars and it it's, uh, sounds amazing on these. And then the track gets kind of very busy, gets busier and busier and a bit clangy and a bit. Um, and, uh, you know, these get lost a bit in that. They don't do that very well. It's like they do 50 percent of Coldplay. So uh, but then Nick Drake, they do 100 percent of Nick Drake. So. Uh, so I think it's important with speakers like this. Um, to listen to them, OK? Or if you if you haven't got any experience of listening to monitor esque speakers, or you haven't heard heard or had the LS five nines before, um, if you're not into that sound, or if you're not into that kind of music, you need to know yourself. Then these are going to be the speakers for you because there will be an absolute progression of what you've heard before, and for me they are, and even. Even though we switched back to sort of yesterday, we switched back to sort of more like, I don't know, call them domestic tuned speakers, uh, including these, you know, then these were more, they're much fuller sound. Um, this is another review coming up about these. It's a separate thing. They're much fuller sound. They're um, easier to listen to. There's bass, which is great, you know, and all that sort of stuff. But even after sw went switching back to these, which are clear as day, these are, 
they're like little bells, you know, like but with with you know, like I say, a fuller sound, more of a modern sound. Um, and then we tried some Dali speakers. It's again you've got to recalibrate your brain the other way around. So this time all the other speakers sounded a bit immediately dull to me. So I had to kind of get over that and retune myself to the fact that they're not dull speakers. None of them are dull speakers. So it's a little bit about what your brain is used to. It's a little bit about what your past experience is and what you uh, like to listen to is definitely a factor. Um, nice chap Ben came here. Uh, he's another person that comes here a lot and he said, I never really, you know, I've read about speakers that are good for this, speakers that are good for that. He said, but until I heard these, um, I never really thought of speakers as being genre specific. He said, but now I really do think I know what that means. Now, this isn't hard and fast. And we had the porcupine tree on these, on the LS59Fs, which is bloody heavy in places. But that worked. Now, you think, well, how come that works? And Coldplay didn't work. Well, I think when porcupine tree gets busy, it gets busy in a very well produced kind of way where there's still a lot of distinction between the individual elements. It's not trying to sound raucous and it's not trying to sound indie raucous. You know, it's it's trying to sound tight and rocky and broken down. And, you know, no matter what bit of that track you put on or any of those tracks, you can still hear Gavin Harrison's drums cutting through clear as day. You know, it's, it's very well recorded. There's, a, there's an element there you can latch on to. And it works, you, you know, you could do with a, you could do with a bit more sort of slam at the bottom end, you know, but it works, you can do it. So it's, it's not, these are not hard and fast rules, but I would say, you know, try and listen to them with your music and something you like, if you can, if you've never heard them before. Um, other than that, well, just to summarise, just to summarise, if you want to, if you've got some of these, and you thought you were going to upgrade to these, then that is not what they are. They're not an upgrade path for something like this because they're so different. Uh, they're probably, in a lot of respects, are an upgrade from other monitor type speakers that lose some of their extension um, at the bottom end. LS59s, LS35As, um, there, are, there are others. Okay, and these are the uncompromised version of those speakers to me. So um, it was also suggested to me, I mean, I'm going to do some research on this. I might even talk to the chaps of Grave Audio and just see if they'll uh, just never speak to me again. But I'd said uh, to a friend of mine, I would have them, even at that price, I would have them. But I would have them because I, I'm into some, a lot of different types of music and I don't really listen to a lot of classical music but the things that I do like to listen to that would sound good on these, sound bloody amazing on these. So I would have them but that would be if I had two good rooms to set hi-fi up in at home, this is. Um, if I could have one system for one type of thing and one system at another type of thing, okay, um, then I would have them. That would be part of one of the systems. Um, he said, well, couldn't you just run a pair of subs with them? And I thought, ah, you can't do that. But maybe you can do that, you know? I mean, um, this is something I'm going to sort of try and look into a little bit as well. You know, if you had sort of smallish, fast enough subs, just to kind of give you that extra bottom end, for some types of music, not for all the time, you know, would that be a bad thing to do? Well, I'm going to revisit that a little bit, that thought. I'm going to do a little bit of reading around and a bit of consultation about that. You know, because uh, I know that Graham Audio do make subs for the LS35A. So, you know, and now Rogers do. A few companies have and do and will do in the future. So, um, but again, you've got to get over that mental thing that you've got. Why would you need a sub with a speaker that size? That's crazy talk. So, um, yeah, so I'm a fan. I'm a fan. Uh, they make me want to go through all the CDs and I've been streaming to them at high resolution and some records to find ones that will sound really good on this. Now that might sound a bit, sound a bit reverse, you know, you would have thought that you'd kind of like, um, you would only buy speakers 
to, to, to make what you've already got sound good. Yeah, you do, you do. But that's not the whole story, is it? Because we're on a journey. It's, it's also a hobby, it's an interest, it's a, it's a compulsion. You know, it's like cheaper than speedboating compulsion, right? And, um, you know, they do make you want to listen to more music and that is never gonna be a bad thing. It's just you find yourself looking for, I wonder what this is going to sound like on these, I wonder what this is going to sound like. And one good thing, a common denominator above all this, is no matter what you put on, you're bound to hear something in it that you've never heard before, for good or for bad. Okay, so in, in a nutshell, that's it from me. You know, I've really fallen for these speakers and I will listen to those in here um, more than the other ones that I've got in here at the moment. There's, there's not a speaker in here that I would want to listen to more than that one because I am in that, whilst I'm not into classical music and I'm not big into jazz, uh, a lot of the music I listen to has kind of quite acoustic components or bits where I'm interested in hearing the production. I like to listen to drums, I like the percussion noises, I like production and, uh, and I'm a musician. So... The musician's part of it appeals to me. So uh, if, if you happen to be around northwest uh, England, UK, Lancashire, and you want a demo of these, we've got them in. And we've got these. Uh, so, um, you know, we're happy to arrange a demonstration with you. You can bring your own music and do all that stuff. You can bring your own amp. Um, <coughs> excuse me. And uh, I just have... The flipping tea's going cold. I don't know. Yeah, so uh, you're more than welcome to come down and have a listen. So, uh, and I think that's just about it for me. I will do a written up review. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about the music we were listening to as well and all that sort of thing. But I would say that, that just treat speakers and things like that, um, there's a lot of people critical of everything, is I'm really critical of too much stuff. I like to treat the equipment and the speakers a bit like uh, it's the right way to treat people is not to just focus on the weaknesses, to focus on the strengths, you know, because if you lean into somebody's strengths, you get the best out of them, you know, and if you lean into the equipment's strengths, if you know what they're good at, you will get the best out of them and you will get the best out of your listening experience. So uh, they have great strengths and they do things a lot of other speakers just will never be able to do. You just need to try and understand and think about what those things are and whether they're the kind of strengths that you want. So um, next time, these will get reviewed, but these need a lot more listening to yet. So that's another couple of weeks of sat down with cups of tea and pieces of cake and listening. So um, tune in next time. Now, don't forget, uh, please like and subscribe and share uh, this video. Subscribe to the channel. Uh, we'd like to see any comments or questions, you know, if you could kind of put underneath. You'll find the written up review on the Phono Stage blog, uh, which you can search for the Phono Stage blog, or you can uh, find it on our website. Or I'll, I'll, I'll remember, I'll remember to put a link underneath here in the text thing okay so thanks very much everyone i'm looking forward to talking to you about the ls6f next time because i've had a few questions about that as well all right thanks very much all bye